right, well, welcome everybody this morning. Um, I understand that the mayor's under the weather, so um, I'm happy to chair unless somebody else wants to. <laughs> so um, we will uh, start out with the first item is the minutes of the meeting for August 29. Everybody's had a chance to review. And uh, if there are any corrections or changes or additions, it would be time to make them at this time. They're move being they moved to second. approval. Is there a second? Second. All right. Uh, Mr. Maxwell made a motion, seconded by Councilmember Bledsoe. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, thank you. The next item on the agenda is the first quarter expenses. I feel like I'm in a hole here. I'm gonna see if I can raise this thing. Up. Well, I guess I won't. I'll just sit down like a little child. <laughs> um, are there any uh, any questions about the first quarter expenses? This is for information only. There being none, um, the next item on the agenda is the ratification of the transfer. The uh, transfer of two three hundred and twenty-one thousand. Move Ms. approval. All right. Motion by Councilmember Bledsoe. Is there a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Evans. Any discussion on the motion? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. All right. Then the next agenda item is the approval of benefits, uh, funeral benefits. I always hate to see this one on here. Um, so we do have a... Um, we have a widow as well as we have a uh, benefit uh, member, so there will be a Move need to be a motion to approve a uh, bene funeral benefit for Miss uh, for William Jesse Jr. Move approval. Okay. Second. Okay. Motion by Councilmember Bledsoe, seconded by Mr. Maxwell. Is there any motion discussion on the motion? Um, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, okay, the investment review. Yay! Here's the fun part. <laughs> All right. Good morning. Yes, good morning. Um, hope everybody's doing well. We're going to review the third quarter performance mm -hmm. for the uh, City Employees Pension Fund, uh, both the liability defeasing portfolio, uh, which seeks to protect uh, the benefit payments in um, <coughs> bonds which have maturities that match to the uh, beneficiary's expected uh, payment uh, payout schedule. And then the, the uh, surplus fund invested in the uh, total return portfolio. So uh, when you open your book, there's a summary on page one that kind of looks at both portfolios. The return seeking portfolio on the left shows a summary of the returns for the quarter uh, from June 30th or July 1st until September 30th, the uh, change in market value is $616,767. Uh, that's the return in terms of the, the gains on the portfolio. Uh, that represents a 3.6% return for the quarter compared to the benchmark return of 3.39%. Uh, the portfolio outperformed for the quarter by about 0.21%. Uh, so that's good news. Uh, the liability defeasing portfolio uh, we're not seeking returns, we're just seeking to match those benefit payments. Uh, when you look at the, uh, the change in market value, it's $101,551 for the quarter. Uh, disbursements uh, that were made from the portfolio are $327,000, uh, $590. And the return for the quarter represents about a 0.8% return. Uh, the changes we made in the liability in the uh, return seeking portfolio this quarter we uh, terminated one of the bond managers and the reason is uh, this bond manager likes to hold a lot of mortgage backed securities or mortgages and we know the biggest buyer of mortgages has been the Federal Reserve uh, to, to create the liquidity in the markets and we know that the Fed is going to begin uh, basically ending the quantitative easing. So they're going to stop purchasing any new mortgages. And so when the biggest buyer of something decides they're not gonna buy anymore, 
the value we expect to go down. So we terminated the manager and uh, we sought a different bond manager that basically owns more credit, more high, you know, investment grade uh, corporate bonds instead. And that gives us, uh, in a growing economy, I think it just gives us a better uh, return outlook uh, versus um, mortgages uh, led type of a fund that is not expected to do very well in the environment we seem to be heading into with the Fed stopping the purchases and, and uh, slowly uh, shrinking their balance sheet. So those are the changes that we did in, in the quarter. Just a quick market update. Uh, there's a lot of nice colorful graphs. Uh, on page three, you could see that the median household income is at a record, uh, a new record high of uh, $59,000 per household. Uh, the female to male earnings ratio uh, is moved up compared to last year. Um, still, you know, not where you'd like to see it uh, at, at equal level, but uh, it's a step in the right direction. Percentage of Americans in poverty has gone down. Uh, and the percentage of Americans without health insurance has also gone down relative to last year. On page four, uh, the economy is growing, uh, you know, still growing at, uh, at, a good, at a good pace. Compared to other countries around the world, uh, I think we're in a pretty good position. Uh, the last quarter we grew by 3.1%. That's a really good news. Uh, that's a good number because we're used to that 2% growth level. So 3.1 is actually really good. Considering the hurricanes, you'd expect the economy to slow down in the quarter where there was a lot of damage from the hurricanes and uh, the loss of productivity in some of the regions. But uh, that number might get revised by economists, but for now, 3.1 is actually a really good number for the quarter. Um, and when you look at the manufacturing index, it's trending up on the right side. Uh, the next page, page five, you see that uh, unemployment is down to 4.2%. Um, so unemployment looks good, economic growth looks good. Uh, people are nervous about the stock market being at all-time highs, uh, but you know that's supported by economic data. It's not, you know, uh, yes, valuations are high, uh, they're historically high. Uh, yes, we can have a correction at any minute, and nobody can ever predict a, 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 a correction. A correction can happen for, for any reason. Could be, you know, a silly reason. Uh, just one little piece of bad news, and uh, without any changes to the fundamental valuations of companies, you can see the market go down, but corrections typically will correct themselves and, and bounce back if the economy is healthy. Um, in terms of predicting a recession, none of the leading economic indicators tell us that we're going into a recession, uh, and you're looking at some of those indicators right now. Um, I would just quickly jump to page seven to talk about the Federal Reserve. A few things going on with the Fed. You know, the Fed dictates a lot of what happens in the economy. Um, and the markets tend to react to everything the Fed does. So it's very important to keep a close watch on what they do. Um, you know, the Fed has been keeping interest rates kind of where they are for the time being. We might see one more rate hike for the end of the year. Um, but this, this chart that you're looking at, uh, the, 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 the blue line and the dots, the dots represent uh, kind of what uh, an assessment of the, uh, the different uh, economists think about where the rates are going to go. Um, and so it looks like rates are trending up uh, between now and 2020. Um, that blue line represents sort of the average or the median view. Uh, so we're, we should see interest rates continuing to normalize. But uh, bear in mind, even if they're going up, they will continue to be very, very low compared to normal levels. And so it's not really seen as a a, a headwind for the stock market. Stocks tend to go down when interest rates go up, but we don't think that that's going to happen in an environment where rates are so artificially low. It's not really a concern. Um, it is a concern for bond investors more so than stock investors, I think, uh, in this environment. Uh, page eight looks at uh, President Trump is going to nominate a new Federal Reserve uh, chairman or woman uh, fairly soon. Uh, there is a small possibility that Janet Yellen might get reelected, but you know most people think that that's not going to happen. Uh, I think the consensus now points to Jeremy Powell. Jeremy Powell is, uh, I think, probably the best candidate from uh, just how the market is going to perceive it type of a perspective. Um, 
he represents uh, more of the same uh, kind of uh, more predictability. If you get someone like uh, Stanford University's uh, Professor John Taylor, you might see um, more disruption in the markets not handling that quite as well. Uh, but uh, all fingers are pointing to this Thursday, Jer uh, Jeremy Powell being nominated. That's the most likely candidate, and that's going to be probably the best news for the markets. Um, Janet Yellen would be also well received by the markets, more of the stability, more of the same. Um, and we've kind of, you know, with the yellow, with Gary Cohen, uh, you know, we've kind of ordered them in terms of, you know, what we think, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, John Taylor and Kevin Walsh. Walsh will be probably uh, less favored by the markets versus uh, Jeremy Powell or Janet Yellen. Um, and then, you know, looking, looking at the next page, the stock market has really been on a tear. Uh, year to date, the S&P 500 is up 14%. And that's crazy for, you know, we're not even done with the year yet. And that's a very high number. Uh, you know, your pension plan is looking for something between 7 and 7.5 seven and or 8% return. Uh, so we're getting, we're getting more than that this year, which is good news for the funded status of most pension plans. Um, and then the next page, uh, page 10, uh, most global economies for the first time in a long time are in sync. They're all growing and accelerating. Uh, you can see the, uh, the not 2017 number, the green represents uh, accelerating growth. You can see more economies are in sync uh, in, the, in terms of the developed, the 45 countries represented by the uh, OECD or the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. These are some of the largest, most developed countries in the world. Uh, so there is, there is global uh, acceleration and growth. It's not just in the U.S. Uh, and then you know when you look at why why is the economy growing, uh, despite you know we haven't seen the policies out of Washington that we you know we thought we might see with the uh, you know elections being over and thinking that um, the. You know, one party is controlling the Senate, the Congress, and the, the, the White House. We might have expected uh, just more, <coughs> more policies, uh, more agreement, but there still seems to be dri uh, gridlock. Uh, despite that gridlock, earnings, um, corporate earnings are, are really are, uh, very high. You, know, you look at the top two charts there, corporate earnings uh, are you know, at all-time highs in terms of earnings per share and what uh, company uh, profitability numbers are at, uh, that's what's really driving the economic growth for the most part. Of course, the consumer is also helping. Uh, consumers are confident about the economy and spending a lot of money, and, uh, and that makes up about 70% of our economic growth. So, you know, people are nervous about where the stock market is, and, you know, I'm nervous too, but I think for now uh, it's supported by economic data. Um, so when you flip to uh, tab two, that's the return seeking portfolio. Uh, I won't bore you with all the details of all the few, all the few pages, all the first few pages talk about what we just kind of went over in summary. Uh, so we'll jump straight to the performance on page 2.1, bottom left hand side there, page 2.1. Let's see how the portfolio did for the quarter. So the fund is at 18.15 million in market value, roughly just over that. And for the quarter ending September 30th, it returned 3.6%. The benchmark returned 3.39%. So we're outperforming the benchmark, which is good. That's what you want to see. Um, if you remember, I think the last two or three times that we've done our report, we were underperforming for the near term. And that's because when Brexit took place in 2016, um, there was a lot of uncertainty. You know, what's going to happen with the negotiation, with Britain leaving the, the Union? There were other countries that were about to have elections and referendums, and it was just too much unknown. And we did not want to expose your the retiree uh, funds to uncertainty, which is risk. And so we took, we took money out of international just to play it safe. Uh, now international, you know, went down, and then it went back up very quickly. And we missed out on that upside. But, you know, we were happy to miss out on the upside because, you know, our, our concern is to protect on the downside. Uh, but the good news is we've made up for that underperformance. Just by sticking to our uh, investment philosophy and strategy, uh, 
we, we uh, made up that underperformance and are able to now show outperformance all the way back to inception um, despite that 2016 blip. So uh, that's some good news for the fund, which continues to outperform its benchmark going back to inception. Um, you, you could see all the different holdings in there. Uh, the only ones I want to point out, uh, just take, take a moment to point out, under fixed income at the bottom, there are two new managers, Double Line Core and Prudential. Uh, those are the two managers that we bought to replace Metropolitan West, uh, the one that holds all the mortgages. So these two funds uh, hold a little bit more corporate and uh, credit risk exposure as opposed to uh, agency exposure and treasuries. And we're happy with that exposure. You know, it's a little bit riskier if you think about it in a normal in a normal environment. But in the environment we're in, where rates are going up, uh, the purchase the main purchaser of mortgages and treasuries is going to stop buying them and is going to be offloading them. You don't want to be holding an asset that's uh, not being bought but really being sold, and and uh, you're going to get hit on the on the price. So we think that that's more risk than uh, having corporate or credit exposure at this time. Um, and then kind of turning to page 2.3 to give you an idea of the cash flows uh, for the quarter. We started out at 17.539 million and we saw uh, net flows of four, negative 14,000. That's pr pretty much the you know fees being taken out of the account. And then the, we saw investment returns of about 630,000, almost 631,000. We ended the quarter at 18.155 million. Uh, you want to look at the year-to-date numbers that are right behind, below that, and then going back 12 months, uh, we started one year ago at 16.3 million, uh, and the uh, returns represent about 1.9 million dollars. So that's pretty good <coughs> for 12 months. Uh, the portfolio has made almost 1.9 million, so it's a pretty good market environment to be in. <coughs> and then finally, uh, page 2.4 looks at the asset allocation we want to make sure we're in compliance with the investment policy so uh, you know looking at the if you prefer to look at the table uh, the asset allocation today or as of the end of the quarter is 41 and a half percent domestic stocks international stocks are about 23.1 percent and then bonds or fixed income is at 35.3 percent uh, the column to the right of that is the investment policy target. That's where we want to be. Uh, and then the ranges, we have very broad ranges that we can be uh, within. Uh, and so when you look at it, we're domestic stocks, we're over the target by 1.5%. For international stocks, we're over by 3%. And for bonds, we're under the target by almost 5%. And that's because of our negative outlook on bonds. That wraps it up for the uh, return-seeking portfolio. Any questions about that portfolio? <laughs> it's 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 a pretty sight. I mean, you know, it, it's beautiful. <laughs> this is. It's still. It, I'm so pleased with how this <coughs> split when they split this into two different areas. That how well it has performed, and I mean, it's everything that was intended for it to be. So, you know, guys are doing a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it was a really good idea to split the portfolio. So because, you know, you're protecting the benefit payments in the liability defeasing portfolio, which we're going to review now, and then, uh, you know, investing kind of like you would a normal pension with any uh, funds that go beyond that. And, you know, when you look at page 15, it gives you a snapshot of the portfolio market value. You know, of course, we're making distributions out of that portfolio, so it, it's going to decrease uh, in size every year. We're now at about 12.4 million uh, in terms of the market value. Uh, the yield to maturity at market is 2.3%. Uh, the yield to maturity at cost is 2.21%. Uh, the internal rate of return is about 1.9%. And, and the average duration is about six and a half. Uh, so, you know, we're, you know, we're not really seeking returns on this portfolio again, and we're not seeking to outperform any particular benchmark. Um, the actuarial uh, liability stream or the projected benefit payment schedule 
you know, is given to us and we basically purchase bonds that have maturities that match that schedule. And so when the, when the bonds mature, you get your par value in whole, regardless of market movement. So uh, hopefully, you know, we adjust every year because we may in some years pay less, in some years we may pay more and we'll adjust every year. Uh, so for the most part, um, all the, the benefit payments are protected through this portfolio. If you look on page 16, you can see the uh, sort of the composition of the portfolio between uh, treasuries and agencies, uh, sort of your kind of uh, least lesser risk holdings. Uh, those tend to be the longer term maturities. Uh, they're about 30% of the portfolio. Then corporate bonds are uh, about 67% of the portfolio. Those are mostly your shorter term maturities. Um, and there's about uh, cash equivalents of about 2.7 percent to meet to meet the uh, benefit payments. Uh, and then when you look on the next page, page 16, there's a there's a summary of uh, the different issuers or the bonds that that are held in this portfolio. Uh, again, you can see there's treasuries, uh, there's agencies, and then the corporate bonds by name. You can see different companies. They're all investment grade, uh, high quality bonds. Um, and th none of the issuers have, you know, uh, a concentration of more than 3%, all 2.5% or less uh, in the portfolio, pretty much. And then you look on page 19, you can see the uh, distribution of the maturities uh, between overnight, under one year, and then one to two years, two to three, and so on. Uh, and, and of course, this ties back to the uh, benefit payment, uh, projected uh, benefit payment schedule. Uh, finally, last couple of pages uh, are more detailed holdings, uh, which show you the uh, you know the, the original cost, the current market value, uh, what the yield is, uh, the accrued interest. Uh, so you can see each individual note. And uh, and that wraps it up for both portfolios. Um, I think we're in good shape. Benefits are protected. We're making some money. Uh, we're not losing money, and, <laughs> and that's good. That's a blessing. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. true. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Is there any questions? Uh, we always appreciate the sunshine that this report brings. I think. <laughs> Um, all right, there being no questions, um, the next item is the special retirees election update. Ms. Allen? Mm -hmm. I'll stand up so everybody can hear me. Um, so we passed the new ordinance that allowed for special elections. So we sent out the nomination forms. We waited a little bit to mimic the same timing as a regular election would be. Um, we're already receiving nomination forms back, and then I believe they're due on November 15th. I think we sent them out around the 18th to give them a full month, and then um, Bill and I will certify them, and then we'll send out the actual election form. So that's where we're at. Right. Any questions? Fabulous. Thank you. All right. and, um, and then the next item is the discussion of the new uh, language and the proposed amendment to the KRS 67A320. Um, just received this today, so. Uh, Looks good to me. Huh? Looks good to me. Does it? Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, being late to the meeting, I haven't even had a chance to read it, so. Um, would you like to. Yes, last, to our last meeting, I was, this, this issue came up uh, because of the way the ordinance read that, uh, that at such time that the member, we didn't have sufficient retirees that it would be filled in accordance with the statute, which didn't provide any other alternatives. Okay. So I was asked to just to, to come up with a recommendation and then we would kind of go from there and then you know, with the idea that once we can agree on something, the board would pass a resolution and ask either the, uh, I guess the city's lobbyist or one of the board members to see if we could get a sponsor to make an amendment. 67 to cover that contingency if we don't have sufficient retirees willing to serve at some point. So I just tried to come up with some language and thought that probably the next interested group that might fill those seats would be beneficiaries 
and after that, then we could just select them as the, as the mayor would normally appoint uh, interested citizens to serve on the board. And I didn't do it under a, an election format. I thought it might just be better for the having the mayor to make a recommendation confirmed by the council as opposed to, because I was thinking elections might be more difficult once you move past the time mm -hmm. to serve. So, mm -hmm. but, but again, open for discussion and, and uh, how we want to proceed. Thank you for pre preparing this and bringing this forward today. Um, you guys had a chance to <coughs> bless, bless you. Bless you. Bless you. The only thing I thought of on the last part of anybody the mayor chooses, if we wanted to do board council members or members of other, did you choose that on purpose or did you think about? I, I tried to go as broadly broad. as I could and then maybe have the board figure out how we wanted to narrow it because, again, this is other than the police and fire on this board, these are the only two I advise, so I'm not mm -hmm. exactly sure how other how the mayor selects other appointees. Uh, for confirmation by council of the board. So I tried to just leave it as general. broad in general. So, but, but again, we can we can go however uh, how the board chooses. Okay. <clears throat> what is the pleasure of this board? Do you want to think this over and bring it back to the next quarter? I mean, obviously January is when the, spe the <clears throat> legislative session begins, so we would probably need to get a sponsor in place before that so that if we want to do it I think we should decide now if you want so well if I understand everything. this correctly it would be from no specific group he would just choose as he does from say the plot like the planning commission he chooses a representative and, and recommends it to the council oh, only once we reach the point that <clears throat> none of your beneficiaries oh, yeah, are willing to serve so at that point if we <clears throat> for example if we got to a point where uh, two retirees were still on there, then that one vacant seat would be filled by a dependent or a spouse that was willing to serve. And, and if we couldn't find them, then the mayor would just pick someone the way he normally picks for other boards and commissions and be confirmed by the council. And, and just so you know, that process is if someone is interested in the community to serve on a board and commission, they must then go to the um, mayor's website and fill out a application and, sh and express their interest and then at that point if they're interested in serving on this then the mayor's office would the mayor and his administrative aides would um, vet that and if they felt like that was a good candidate then they would submit it to us as council members and then we would go through and uh, vet it further and make sure and then we would we could approve so it. So if there's more than one person's mm -hmm. person interest the council chooses? Well, the mayor chooses first and then mm -hmm. submits it to us. Oh, so, but we, there, I, I mean, I do feel like this is a, a viable option. And I, you know, I think this, so, I think so. I mean, because technically you could get someone in the community that has some really good uh, expertise in um, mm -hmm. um, pension. Uh, or, I mean, you know, there, there could be. Mm -hmm. So well, I think you have to rely on the mayor and council to choose the right person to right. take care of things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and we do that with the plethora of boards and commissions now, and I, I feel like that for the most part that we do a pretty good job. So I don't know the mayor does as, as so. yes, Scott. Um, what we've done with the uh, police and fire pension is there's a number of sort of similar fixes, um, and the thought was that unless it were urgent. Um, we would wait until the pension uh, reform happened and then sort of proceed at, in Frankfurt. Um, that was a, the thought um, the police and fire Well, Judy said the same thing about this board. She didn't want them knowing how much money we had in case they tried to take mm -hmm. it. So, I mean, seriously, that was, she said that what, yeah. a month or two Staying ago? The radar. Okay. Yeah, and so I, th I think we could intend to do it and let's just wait. I, yes, I don't think mm -hmm. um, hopefully in the next year or so I think we will we'll have mm -hmm. uh, obviously people still ready and willing to serve. So this is mm -hmm. just trying to, to you know prepare for that contingency somewhere down the road depending on how the fund as long as it stays in operation. Sure, sure. Well, that sounds good. I know it does and I mean and I guess the way I look at it is is we're having the language then we can move forward at, at the appropriate time. Um, I def definitely take the advice of making sure that we step carefully 
<laughs> as carefully as possible. So, so yeah, well, would we want to, because we're not, if what, if I heard it correctly, we're not trying to get this passed in this session. We're trying to stay under the radar, right? Mm-hmm. Then I don't know if we actually want to vote on it then yet, because then it That's would be... That's what she was saying, I think. Oh, it was just that? to wait on it. Oh, okay. I heard way out of the question. Okay. That's okay. we we'll just, I mean, the fact that we have it here, and then uh, maybe what we could do is um, next October, we could have mm -hmm. it slated to where we bring it back up, and uh, um, Mrs. Allen, if you wouldn't mind to maybe make a note, we could bring it back up at the October meeting of next year, and... And that way it'd be in time for the session for 2019. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> going so too fast. It does. It does. So, okay. Um, I appreciate the work on this. I really do appreciate you bringing forth the language. And uh, so, um, is there any other discussion? Any other questions? No? Move adjourn. Tell you this is Second. the quickest meeting ever. So. Good. All right, all right. Thanks everybody for being here. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. <laughs> 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 too much family. No.